Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study. And this is study number 151. So in studying Daniel chapter 11, you know, we're, we're now getting into verse 25 and on. So that's pretty, pretty good. But uh, it's taken a while to get there. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this new week of study and for the blessings uh, that we had in the Sabbath yesterday and the things that we are studying and learning and the things that you are showing us about ourselves. And we just pray for your spirit to be here to speak to each heart and and to heal the wounds that can exist uh, because of sin. We know, Lord, that you love us and care for us and that uh, sometimes we can get caught up in ideas and um, not recognize uh, the purpose of truth. We pray, Lord, that the truth can affect us, that it can change us uh, from the inside out. And um, we pray, Lord, for this study in particular. There's many things that we have tried to understand and have taken time. Uh, but we just ask, Lord, that we can have patience in your leading and guiding in our lives and this movement. And... Um, and that your work can be accomplished upon this earth. We pray for those watching these videos who are searching, that you can lead the correct people to study these things, and that um, it will encourage them in their walk with you. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher now, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning again. I was just going through some of these notes here, looking at things that... Uh, We've learned it, I, I'm going to be editing these notes at some point and putting a lot more writing in. So it's going to be basically a fairly large paper on Daniel chapter 11. And uh, but right now, you know, we're just still working through these things, trying to understand them. And in particular, where we've been, we, we got really bogged down is not the right word, but maybe maybe it is a good word. Really trying to dig into the the rise of Rome, and especially looking at verses 22, 23, and 24. We spent a lot of time, basically, well, from verse 14 to, to 24, quite a while, like a couple of months or more, just looking at those those verses. And, and I think it was extremely profitable. I think that it's really helped us to understand uh, these lines better. And, and the main point is to understand God's intervention in this history and the purpose of Daniel 11, that it's unfolding the rise of, of Rome, first uh, pagan Rome, in which Christ is going to be crucified, and then the period that starts in 1798 with papal Rome ending and the Millerite history beginning. So, of course, Papal Rome is part of this history as well. But the end of Papal Rome becomes really significant because it becomes the time of the end. And um, I think that's one of the, the keys that has been missing in our understanding of looking at Daniel chapter 11 is one is we haven't looked at it as broadly as we should. Uh, you know, 10, 11 and 12 all together as as a, a section of prophecy in the book of Daniel, but also its connection to chapter eight and chapter nine. So to the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. And, and that I think has been really, uh, for me personally, that's the thing that I've gotten from this study of Daniel chapter 11 that I didn't fully grasp before. And I think that has shed a lot of light on uh, some of these passages in the historical um, application of Daniel chapter 11 that people just have missed. Um, that we missed, right? So, so that would be, you know, the big takeaway so far for me. Uh, when we get to, uh, verses 25 to 29. So just to kind of go back a little bit and review, we know that we're going to have, uh, the rise of Rome and, and there's going to be a lot of repeat and enlarge. So when we get to this, you know, we're going to have times we come up to the crucifixion of Christ. And then we go back, you know, we go back to this Roman Jewish League. And that Roman Jewish League is going to give us that history. 
uh, dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem and even events that are going to happen with the end of the persecution and the move, movement of the capital of Rome from Rome to Constantinople. And that's verse 23 and 24. And then when we go to verse 25, we now are going to go back again in a repeat and enlarge back to Octavian. Now, when we had this sort of flashback, we'll call it, of of going back to this history of the Roman Jewish League all the way up to this history, this line of 23 and 24. The reason that that is done is because we have uh, the crucifixion of Christ. We have these events here. We have, you know, we have Augustus, we have Tiberius, but then we need to have this, this information from Daniel chapter nine about the crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the week. And then obviously the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, right? So that's Daniel 9, verse 26 and 27 are really being expanded in this history. And, and that makes sense to people, right? Why that would be, why the scriptures are written this way. I don't know. Anybody have a comment on on that? I mean, it's very logical, but, but you know, is it something that um, that other people see quite clearly that it has to be that way? That this is how how prophecy is structured. You know, instead of looking at Daniel 11, just chronologically moving through the history of of all of the um, the battles between uh, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic Empire, we these verses that m- most you know expositors are going to apply to Atticus Epiphanes and so forth. You know, we're applying them to Rome, and and this just seems to make the most sense. Right. We, we are going to go back to that history of Atticus Epiphanes, but what's important there is that Roman Jewish League, right? because it's all about Rome. Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. That's any comments on that, Stephen? Yeah, I just uh, I was watching that Seventh Day Press. Now they armor the Uriah Smith view, but they kind of explained that quite well. That it's going through Media Persia, Greece, Rome just with the political side, and then it sort of goes back to sort of pick up where Rome connects with the Jews, and that how that leads on then to the persecution of God's people in the time of the papacy. Okay. Um, so it's just sort of like a, just doesn't continue on with the political, but sort of a, has one thing, and then it sort of picks up, goes back a bit to pick up another theme. Right. Yeah. So, and who is that? Who does that? That was the Seventh Day Press. So mm-hmm. they are some Adventists from, I think, from Canada mostly. Uh, the guy presenting, I think he's originally from Bulgaria. But, um, so we have differences, you know, up to certain, with some, some of his views. <clears throat> but, uh, some things he, uh, we can't agree with. Okay. Yeah. So, so obviously God's going to show lots of different people, uh, who aren't connected with us insights into these things. But, but I think that this does make the most sense how we had worked this out. And so when we started looking at, uh, 25 to 29, I, I did this sort of broad overview looking at this time appointed and the time at the end, because this, this obviously becomes an important point. And, and we, so I differ from Uriah Smith in where he says the time appointed is, is the end of the, um, the 360 years. And, and, and to me that that can't be the case based upon just using Miller's rules. But this time appointed has to be connected to the end of the 2520s. So, so we're just going to go through these verses again. Uh, and see what we have here. And so we just keep going through and kind of gleaming and, and correcting ourselves. So right now we're not really looking at the present truth application. We might refer to it once in a while, but from verse 25, it's going to go back to Octavian. So he, pagan Rome, under Octavian, the king of the north, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. And that's going to be Egypt under, uh, Antony, right? So, the great army of the, of the 
and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great mighty army but he antony shall not stand octavian defeated him in the battle of actium so this is going to go back to this battle of actium it's it's going to address that history that that we've already covered um even for a time right and then for they shall forecast devices against him now we didn't we didn't put this in here uh so who's the they and who's the him? We talked about it. And I know Stephen has a lot of interest in this, this part. Now the forecasting the devices, right? We know that that's going to be, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And we, we have that from the city of Rome. And if, and if it's against the strongholds, then we have a different interpretation there. So. So we have the even for a time, these two different dates, 30 B, 31 BC to 330 AD and 48 BC to 313 AD. So this provides a structure from November 9th, 1989 to December 5th, 2021. Who, who's forecasting their devices? It's, it's Rome, right? Rome is forecasting their devices. Okay. So now yeah. as they're, as they're forecasting their devices, do these words in the Hebrew, could they also mean that they are contriving a plan? Yeah, they're plotting their machinations, right? So there, there is a plan, yeah. So, and, and that's one of the things we haven't really, like, I mean, we obviously know their plan is to become this, this universal empire, right? They want to conquer all of this area, right? They want to conquer this territory. Uh, but we know that it's Rome doing that, whether they're forecasting their devices against something or they're forecasting their devices from Rome, from the stronghold or against the stronghold. We say that both both interpretations can apply. So when we get to verse 25, and we're going to go back to Octavian, right? So we're going to go back to this history dealing with uh, the Battle of Actium. That's going to be the beginning of that, even for a time. He's going to stir up, that is, arouse, wake up, his power and his courage against the king of the south. So that's going to be Egypt under Antony. So obviously uh, Cleopatra is, um, you know, in charge, so to speak. But um, she's, she's aligned with Antony, right? So this is a type of civil war within the Roman Empire to some degree. But the idea is that they need to conquer Egypt. Now, we, we, when we look at this and, and we look at the present truth application, we can see the parallel with uh, Daniel 11, verse 40b. So it says, uh, the king of the south shall be stirred up. And in this case, it's a different word, right? It's to anger. So it's going to be stirred up to anger to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he, and we decided that's Antony, shall not stand. Octavian defeated him in the Battle of Actium, 31 BC. And then we're going to have this forecasting of devices again. It's exactly the same words. Uh, for, but it says, for they, not he, but they shall forecast devices against him. And then it says, yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat. And we had the discussion about this. You know, is this Antony's army that's dependent upon Egypt for grain, or is it is it Rome itself that is is dependent upon this grain? And so they that ford of the, uh, feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. That would be Antony, you know, being destroyed by Octavian's uh, military, right? Well. Right. So or it could be, you know, Antony's army that turns upon him uh, that destroys him. So the thing is, uh, they forecasting his devices. We have to wonder why is this in the in the plural? Where the other ones in the singular, masculine, singular, this is a masculine plural. And so so we haven't really decided that we didn't put it in here. OK, you have a comment there, Dwight? If we were to approach with what you just touched on and i'm i'm not ignoring 1125 but with what you just touched on from 1126 if we apply the rule of first mention i find it intriguing that 
the portion of his meat that this phrase is first being presented to us in Daniel 1.5 and primarily through the first chapter of Daniel. It's a Persian word, not Hebrew, not Aramaic, but we're talking about meat that's offered to idols. Yeah, the dainty. It's a meat that's offered to idols, right? That's going to be uh, the word path bag, right? So if if we're looking at this one particular portion here, as you just said, path bag, why is it necessary for us to understand that this Persian word is going to be important for this part of the study? Okay. So that the fact that it's a Persian word. Right. That it's, it's food sacrificed to idols. Okay. So that's the representation in Daniel 1, yes. Mm-hmm. Because if we're dealing with something where they that feed, they that devour the meat sacrificed to idols shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. Here again, from last week's study, you were pointing out that the denominative that we that we see here of him does not always mean in Hebrew what it does in the English. Yeah, it doesn't always refer to, we're not always sure who it's referring to. They have different rules that, of grammar than we do in English as far as order of things. Okay, so the feeding of the portion of his meat. So this is of these dainties, which which would refer to food sacrificed to idols, the thing that uh, Daniel and his three friends refused, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Now, the thing is, they that feed the portion of his meat. Now, this meat, we we would say that this comes from Egypt in in either case. Right. No, No matter how we're looking at this interpretation, this is from Egypt, whether it's Rome that's feeding of the portion of his meat or whether it's, um, you know, the army of Cleopatra and Antony that was feeding of the portion of his meat. And, and it's the ones that feed of the portion of this meat that destroy him, whoever him is. But then it says, and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. So we have a symbol there, which we usually attribute to the Sunday law, the overflowing of, of, of an army. And this has to be, of course, talking about 30 BC, right? That's at least that's how we've looked at it. This is this is dealing with the battle of, of Actium. And then it's going to deal with the, distri- the fall of Egypt. So when we say destroy him, that would be Antony and his arm. Uh, uh, and then the, he, when it says his army shall overflow, that's obviously not the one who's destroyed, right? That his army must be the army of the king of the north. So, you know, we, we could pr- probably put some of this in here to just help us sort it out. So um, so we got Octavian's army shall overflow, and we have Antony commit suicide. That's going to be August 1st, 30 BC. So this is not just about Antony, so that shall destroy him. Let me see, how would we put this? Okay, so yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat. So who's the they? Have, have we decided who they are? So I, I would say that this is Antony's army. So Antony's army is going to be the one that feeds of the portion of his meat. And his, uh, this would refer to what well, we sort of put it there, but um, his meat, Antony's army is dependent upon Egypt for grain. But we could just say Egypt's, just to sort of clarify that. Now, that's one interpretation. That's not the one that, you know, we originally had. <clears throat> so I, I had a different view. I convinced Stephen of my view, and then, then I changed my view. And then I have to convince Stephen of this one. I don't know. Would we, would we also, in, in applying this as Antony's army, apply this as the king of the south's army okay so instead of antony just put the king of the south well i mean we could put antony or king of the south okay 
Okay, I'll put King of the South's army. I don't want to capitalize King. King of the South's army is dependent upon Egypt for grain. And then we have, so we still haven't said when they shall forecast their devices against him, we haven't really decided on who they are. So we know the forecasting of the devices in, in verse 24 was Rome. Is it the same power that forecasts his devices? And now the other thing that has here, um, so in, in we should take note of, so when he's going to forecast his devices against the strongholds, it's going to be the Hebrew number 5921, just Al. So it has, starts with an I, which is kind of a guttural sound, Al. So that's the word against, right? But here, when we're going to look at he shall forecast his devices against him, well, it's the same word, never mind, 5921. So, so that, so if it's 5921, we have it as from him. So in the, in the one we say it's against, but we wouldn't say he's going to forecast his devices from him. Would we say that? So here we're going to just say it's against normally. Does that make sense? Can it we use like it? They, they, we wouldn't say they shall forecast his devices from him. Like we wouldn't say that. Right. So, so when we make the argument that it's from his strongholds, I'm just looking at some of these other translations of this. And so everybody has it as well, some of these translations are weird. Yeah, there's one translation that says, uh, but the southern king won't be able to withstand him because of the schemes devised against him. So everybody has it's in some ways against. So the 5921 is always going to be against. Yet here again, applying mm-hmm. the, the rule of first mention would take us back to Genesis 1, Genesis 1 verse 2. Okay. What, what does that say? The word is not translated as against. It's a trans, it's translated as a pawn. Yeah. So the, so the word has all kinds of meaning. Right. Right. It, it's like to say that means against. It, it, I mean, it always depend upon the context. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, of course, we're putting it into, uh, an English, uh, preposition, right? Obviously. Right. Hebrew prepositions are completely different in how English is kind of weird how it uses prepositions, to be honest, uh, <laughs> compared to a lot of other languages. We have so many different prepositions where a lot of languages don't have as many, and we use them in a wide variety of ways. So uh, people who learn English sometimes have a hard time understanding how to use our prepositions. They're, they, we, we, there are rules uh, but they're very complex and hard to formulate. But anyway, but if you think about it here, uh, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Well, you can see that it could be darkness was against the face of the deep, right? Because if something's upon something, it's also against it, isn't it? So we can see that the word against here is not, not necessarily in opposition to. Like, I'm against everything that person stands for is quite a bit different thing than, you know, I leaned my guitar against the wall, right? Agreed. Yeah. And so, so this word much more is like, I lent, you know, I leaned my guitar up against the wall, you know, rather than, you know, I, uh, I fought against him with my guitar as a weapon, you know, (laughs) right? It'll be a little bit different especially for the guitar or, or the person in the wall. Okay, so so what what is being said here um, as far as this word? So if we uh, look at this, it says, um, i got to go back to this document. So he's going to forecast his devices against him. I mean, we could say upon him, right? Right. But But this is just a plan that is going to be involved in defeating him. So they're, they're plotting against him or upon him. Like this is a plan that is this particular, it must be the him must be Antony, right? Or Egypt. But you know, it's, but the question is why is it they shall forecast devices against him? That's the question because before it's, it's Rome. It's he that forecasts his devices, but now it's they. So why is it they? 
is there specifically a Hebrew word that is uh, being used for they, or is this just because the way that um, Kashab is being used, that they're using it in the plural? Um, well, I'm just looking at this right now in the Hebrew. There's so few Hebrew words here. Okay, so trying to understand the sentence here. I'm looking at the Hebrew. It doesn't make sense. So I'm going to have to think about this. Just um, sometimes when they translate a verse. Okay, so it's going to start out with they that feed, right? So that's going to be this word feed um, means to eat. And then the portion of his meat, that's going to be the the path bag. And so they that feed, path bag, and the portion of food for king's delicacies. And they shall break in pieces. So it's definitely uh, the imperfect third masculine, third person masculine plural. And then it says the word strength. So after it says that they're going to destroy, well, that doesn't make sense. So, so they shall break in pieces. And then, then it has, uh, the vav consecutive, which they translate as four. So, you know, it should be and, and then it's going to have this word, the halo, the halo, which is, it's just, um, hmm, does it make sense? Okay. So I guess they're using it. As, so, they're using it so his his strength shall overflow or his army his force shall overflow so that is the masculine singular and then it has uh the word uh, overflow right which is the third person masculine singular and then we're going to have uh, a vav consecutive and many so it's going to actually have and fall down, right? So that's the next word. They shall fall down. So they put here, many shall fall down, but uh, they, the many is they. So this is a masculine plural. Ha, halalin, to fall down slain, to be pierced. And then you have the word many. So uh, at the end, which is a masculine plural, again, so the, the, the masculine plural here, it talks about the they in a masculine plural, right? They that eat of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. He shall forecast, um, he shall overflow, right? So they forecast their devices against him. They that eat of the portion of his meat is a they, and they're going to destroy him and many that fall down and are slain are going to be a they as well. So I know this is just trying to understand this sentence. So so going back to verse 25. So if we go look at verse 25 and 26 together, he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. And, and so this is going to be the battle of Actium, for they shall forecast devices against him. So they have a plan. Now, we do know in the battle of Actium that the plan or the plot had to do with how they interrupted the flow of grain to Antony and Cleopatra's army, right? But the question is, why is it they? Because we have he shall stir up his power. And he shall not stand. That's going to be the king of the south and king of the north. But it says, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, that they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. Now, sh should this they then refer to the armies of Antony? Is, is that a possibility? Because they're the ones that are going to feed of the portion of his meat and that shall destroy him. So could this forecasting of the devices not be about uh, Rome forecasting its devices, but that this is of uh, the military itself. So it's referring to what ends up happening with the military, uh, turning over from 
being Antony's military to being Octavian's military. Does that make any sense? I mean, we're just looking at this, right? I'm not saying that that's the way it should be or the way it is. I just have the problem with the they, because the one thing in Hebrew is that, that the plurals refer to the same thing. And we have the king of the north and the king of the south as being referred to as he. But now we have a they introduced, and the they then are that feed of the portion of his meat. Does that make sense, Stephen? Do you have any thoughts on that? So, um, so because we yeah, have this thinking is more connected uh, with Octavian's army. The they to Octavian's army. That was my original understanding. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was my original understanding. But so you're saying that they that forecast their devices against him is going to be Octavian's army that's going to forecast their devices against Antony. And they are the ones that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. And so his meat here is the kings of the south's meat. And the ones that feed of the portion of that meat are going to be the armies of Rome. And, and this would make sense, too. So he comes with a very great and mighty army. So we have uh, two different great armies. We have the great army of Rome that's going to come. And then we have uh, the army of the king of the south. Now, the, the army of the king of the south, the king of the south is not going to stand. But it says, for they shall forecast the vices against him. What if we had it to be both armies? That both armies, in a sense, are involved in defeating the king of the south. Any thoughts on that, Stephen? I would tend to favor one or the other. <laughs> to say it's both. I know you mean that they are. Well, because we have the army of the king of the south and we have the army of the king of the north, right? And they're going to come to battle. But the army of the king of the south is not going to stand. Or, or the king of the south is, himself is not going to stand, for they shall devise their plans against, you know, uh, the king of the south. And is it possible that the they is referring to both of these armies that because his army does turn against him, right? His army is yes. right? And 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 it, and it would be true that both of these that are feeding of the portion of his meat uh, are going to destroy him. But then when it says his army shall overflow, that's obviously the king of the north's army, not the king of the south's army, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The thing is, people are being fed from Egypt. Egypt is going to be defeated. And and it's just the, the fact that it's they shall forecast their devices is the thing that bothers me. Because if it said he shall forecast his devices against him, I'd have no problem saying, well, that's the king of the north. Right. But because it's they shall forecast his devices, that confuses me because who's they? And we could just say it's well, it's just the army or it's they that feed of the portion of his meat. But but we know that that both the army of the king of the north, that is Octavian's army and Antony's army are feeding of the portion of his meat. Right. They're both dependent upon Egypt. I mean, they're both going to bite the hand that feeds it or that feeds them. Exactly. So maybe that's why this is brought up, feeding of the portion of his meat. It's just that Egypt is the one that is supp supplying this meat. But these armies are going to come and overflow. And there might be some application once we start applying this in, in our history that might make this make more sense. But, you know, I get stuck on these things, right? So I apologize a little bit. But I I think that makes the most sense, that it's just... Because the question is, why are you bringing up they that for the feed of the portion of his meat that destroy him? Right. It, it just seems to me an odd thing to bring up unless we have a reason. And, and the reason there would fit well with the fact that everyone in this battle is to depend upon Egypt for grain, for food. So, so do I you agree with that, Stephen? It's a possibility. I would agree. Yeah. It's definitely a possibility, and it's something we're going to have to, you know, keep in mind when we look at a present truth application, because we, we need, then need to know what the feeding of the portion of the meat is. Now, the idea that this has to do with idolatry, I think, uh, is an important point, that it's a Persian loan word dealing with the, the meat that comes from the king's table, which is, is, is a food that has been sacrificed to idols. 
So there's there's definitely something there because this would be, um, you know, in, in a sense, it's, it's a type of doctrine or understanding or, or philosophy or something like that, maybe in, in our history. So there, it has to have some parallel in our history. So so they're going to turn upon the one that has been feeding them and they're going to destroy that, which in this case is the king of the south. And we're going to have the symbols of the Sunday law there, right? And we're going to have the great slaughter, right? Many shall fall down slain. So, so this one thing we can agree on is this is the battle of Actium and the aftermath. So this is going to represent uh, 30 B, 31 BC and 30 BC. And then when we go to verse 27, it's going to go back to this alliance uh, between Antony and Octavian. And, and we say that both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief has to do with their personal ambition. They speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. And then we have, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Now, to try to put that the end shall be at the time appointed, I'll just add this up a bit. Um, why are they introducing this at this time in the prophecy? So they're going back to the Battle of Actium, and, you know, the defeat of Egypt in 30 AD. And then they, so, that, so they're there. And then they're going to go back even before that to their alliance. And then they're saying, this is not going to prosper. And then it says, certainly, and we said yet is an iteration. So certainly yet. So this is certainly again, the end shall be at the time appointed. Can we say that this is, and this is what we tried to talk about last week, is this saying that what's happening there at the end of that period is typifying what's going to happen at the time appointed. And that time appointed is from Daniel chapter 8. At the end of that period dealing with Millerite history. So, so there was some suggestion that maybe I was stretching things a little bit. But we know that the time appointed is connected to the time of the end. And, and we looked at, you know, all these different times appointed and times of the end here. And so I believe so the time... The beginning of the 360 and no. uh, related to 31 BC? So I'm saying that the time appointed does not have to do with the 360 years. I'm saying it has to do with Millerite history. I don't know if you saw the video where we went through yes, that. Yes, I, I know, yes. But to okay. me, it's just way out of context. It's just like okay, way off the, the history or the context of what Daniel 11 is speaking about. So, Except that, me, I, I, yeah, okay. So what about the word certainly and yet? Because yet is an iteration. That's a repetition. So what I was saying is that it's it's looking at this history, right? And it's saying that this history is typical of something that's going to happen at the time of the end. And and, and I get that from, from this iteration there, the word yet. It's showing that this history is, is symbolizing something, that it, it says it right in the text, that this, that this history is typifying, that is, the 360 years, that is a period of time, right? Mm-hmm. The end of that period is typifying something that's going to happen again in the future at the time appointed. Because remember, in Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, he's referring back to chapter 8 and 9. And the time appointed is from chapter 8. Now, part of the problem that we had here too, Stephen, if you remember, if this is Octavian that's being talked about, right? So we know it can't be Octavian because that's how Swearingen tries to do this. And he says, you know, his his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, but yet Octavian never encounters Christianity, yes. right? And we have to put the whole the Holy Covenant as Christianity. So, so one is uh, it definitely isn't addressing Octavian. It is a, a dre- addressing uh, events that are going to happen all through that history up to the end of the 360, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know why I have no bracket there. So with that word yet, it just seems to me that it's now 
comparing these two things. But it's it's saying all of this stuff that's happened, it's typical of something that's going to happen. That's that's how I take an iteration. Mm-hmm. And I, exactly the same thing in Isaiah chapter seven. When it uses that um um within sixty five years, it's the same word. Shall Ephraim be broken? And when I looked at that, what it's saying is that what happens to uh, northern Israel is also going to happen to Judah. That's what the word yet is telling us in that passage in um, Isaiah 7, uh, verse, whichever verse it is, I can't remember, 5 or 6 or something. Verse 8. Verse 8, yeah, verse 8. Okay, so so that's the way that I've taken that word for quite a long time, that it, it means that what happened to northern Israel what happened to Judah. And what's going to happen to northern Israel will happen to Judah. Uh, within 65 years, it's not saying that the, that northern Israel is going to be taken captive within 65 years. It's not actually giving a time for when northern Israel is going to be taken captive. It's just, it's just saying something's going to happen to northern Israel and that will happen to Judah in 65 years. And then later on, it's going to explain what's going to happen to, to northern Israel, it's going to be forsaken of its king, and Judah's going to be forsaken of its king at the end of the 65 years. But it doesn't specify specifically when that happens with northern Israel. And and so that's the way that I take this word here. So when I see that word, 5750, I take it as a repetition of something. And so that's why I applied it that way. And then it makes more sense to me because this time appointed, we always connect with the time at the end. Does that ex- explanation help? Or are you still, you know? No, that, that uh, does help, yes. Okay. Right. So then when it says, he, the king of the north, shall return into his land with great riches, and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, he shall do and return to his own land. Now, I have a problem with this part with this verse 28, right? So we we have Swearingen's interpretation here. We know that the king of the north is going to return into his own land with great riches, that is the wealth of Egypt, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So here he's going to have, we changed some of it already, because he's going to have Octavian's, not pagan Rome's heart. And, and so we put pagan Rome in here. And so it's going to bring us through this history of, so here's how I would look at it. It's going to talk about the end of that 360 years, says that this is going to be typical of what's going to happen uh, at the end, which is going to be the extremity. That's going to be at the time appointed. That's the end of the prophetic periods. And then it says, well, he, Rome is going to return to his land with great riches. So Rome now has this Roman Empire, right? And Rome, pagan Rome's heart, shall be against the Holy Covenant. That's the Christianity and the area of Judea, Palestine, right? Now that's going to deal with the 70 weeks, right? So the first part is addressing the end of the 2520s and the 2300 days, you know, sort of connected together. Um, but it's bringing us back to the present and saying it's pagan Rome that's going to come against Christ and Christianity, right? And then it says he shall return to his own land. Now, the question is, why does it say that? It says he shall return into his land. And then it says he's going to be against you know, Christianity after after this time. And then it says, he shall do and return to, to his own land. So why does it repeat that? So it's it's got a repeating at the beginning of the verse and a repeating, like a return at the beginning of the verse and a return at the end to his own land. So he returns, he's wealthy, he's going to do, he shall he shall be against the Holy Covenant and he shall do, and return to his own land. So what's happening here? Because there's some very specific things, and I'm not happy with just uh, going over them uh, cursorily. I want to understand what's happening. So so can we say that when he returns to his own land with great riches, that's after the Battle of Actium? 
or not the battle, but defeating Egypt. Because they're yes. going to get Egypt. Okay. But then it's going to say, Pagans Rome's heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. Well, when is this? This definitely isn't um, in that period of time. It has to be later. Now it's already it's gone through. It's it's already gone through this history, right? So it went through this history, uh, dealing with uh, you know verse twenty, you know what was it, nineteen to twenty two, where it's going to go through, you know Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius. And then, and then the destruction of Jerusalem and the crucifixion of Christ. So it's going to cover Daniel chapter nine, verse 26 and 27, um, at the end of that in verse 22, right? And, and so now it's going to, it's going to go through the battle of Actium. It's going to, you know, through the league and all that. And then it's going to go and specifically address uh, the battle of Actium. And then it's going to even go back a bit further about this alliance and, and that it's not going to turn out very good. For them, it's it's but but this alliance and all these things that happen in their failure are going to be a type of what's going to happen at the end of the 2300 years in the 2520s, the end of the prophetic periods. And then it's going to um, address what's going to happen at the end of the 70 weeks. Right. So it's going to now go to to um, the matter right? that he understands that's going to be uh, dealing with the 70 weeks. And, and then it says the king of the north returns to his own land. So we, we can agree that that's at the beginning there of this 360 years, right? But yet this is only typical. The end of this is pointing forward to the end of the 2300 days, the prophetic periods. Um, so he returns to his own land, right? This is the beginning. And then pagans, Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, so Christianity, right? So just trying to get this focus. And, and we can see when that history is. That's going to be, of course, the crucifixion of Christ and the persecution that's going to follow. And so then it says, you know, he's against the Holy Covenant and he shall do. So he's going to do. And then he's going to return to his own land again. Right. So so if he's returned to his own land after he went against the king of the south, He's then going to go against Christianity, and then he's going to go back to his own land again. So would this refer to what happens in the, the Roman Jewish wars? I think that's how Uriah Smith applied it. So okay. that this holy covenant he was applying to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and yeah. then returning to, uh, to Rome again would be yeah. the triumphal march of Titus. You have the the, the Arch of Titus there with Menorah and so forth. Okay, so that's a really good point, because one of the things we see, he returns to his own land with the riches of Egypt, right? There's going to be a triumph there, right? Mm-hmm. It, we know that there is. And then we're going to see this later after they come against Jerusalem and destroy it. We're going to have uh, the triumph of, of, of Titus. So that makes perfect sense. But we can also see why this is being pointed to as a type of something that's going to happen. Is the destruction of Jerusalem a type of the end of the world? Yes. Right. And we know what happens in that history of of Rome against Christ and the Christians and, of course, against the Jews as well, is typical of what happens at the end of the world. So then the next verse, 29 says, at the time appointed, he, the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south. And I'm saying that this is not, this is, is not talking about events there at that time, but it's actually talking about what it had talked about earlier, that the time appointed, right? So now it says, we had all of this happen. This is typical of what's going to happen at the time appointed. And that time appointed here, it either has to be 1798 or 1989. But here, because the king of the north returns and comes toward the king of the south, this must refer to 1989, not 1798. So it's going to, and just because it's the king of the north, unless you were going to, 
you know, say the king, that some other power comes against the king of the south. It obviously has to be the king of the north. And he comes towards the king of the south. And, and we couldn't put that in 1798 because it's the king of the south that comes against the king of the north. And that's why it says, but it shall not be as the former that is in the fall of Egypt or as in the latter that is the fall of Rome is what I put there. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know. The fall of Rome part, I'm not certain about. Because there is a 476. Yeah, so 476. But we have to say, why is it not like the former and the latter? What characteristics is it unlike? So if we say this is 1999 or 1989, that the time appointed here is referring to, this is a little bit more controversial than it being just 1798. But but I'd say it's 1999 because it's now going to address Daniel 11, verse 40b. Uh, so the first part, when he talks about the time appointed, that's going to address Daniel 11, verse 40a. But now he's going to take out what happens here, and he's going to address Daniel 11, verse 40b. Daniel 11, verse 40 is, is, is talking about this history that this history is typical of, right? And so he's going to address the time appointed. He's going to address the time appointed in 1798, the end of the prophetic periods. And he's then going to address the time appointed in 1989. Because this can't be 1798. And, and the king of the north is now going to come against the king of the south. Well, the king of the south has already been defeated. Egypt is no more. And so this has to be the king of the north defeating the king of the south at the time appointed, in the time of the end. And this time of the end would be the Daniel 11, verse 40b, time of the end. And so he comes against the pape towards the south. So that is the king of the north is the papacy, the USA, and they're going to come against the Soviet Union. But it shall not be as the former. So I have no problem with that being the fall of Egypt in 30 AD. Or as the latter. Now, the question is, why would I put the fall of Rome as the latter? Because, well, is, I mean, the king of the north and the king of the south, it, there, maybe there's another king of the north, king of the south battle that we'd have to look at. We could say maybe 1798. Um, and the way that it's not like it is that the king of the north is actually going to defeat the king of the south. I don't know. Anyway, any thoughts on this? Because this is probably the most controversial of all the verses. You know, this is definitely dependent upon the interpretation of the time appointed as referring to the time of the end. Now, I didn't put the, the Hebrew uh, numbers in here yet, so I'm going to do that. Dwight, do you have any thoughts on this? Anybody have any thoughts on this? I'm still kind of thinking it through. Okay. Well, can you tell me what your thinking is doing? Just think out loud. Don't do that very well. <laughs> That's the only way I can think. So, okay. So the time appointed here, we're still going to sit, we're still going to have that word Moed, right? H4150. Okay. So we got the time appointed. That's Moed. That's, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put November 9th, 1989. So we just put he, the king of the north. So, uh, but it's he shall return. And that's going to be Shuv, 7725. And there's a lot of returning, right? I mean, he returns into his own land, you know, a couple of times, right? But now he's going to return. But this time, and the turn can mean uh, return. It can just mean uh, to turn, right? So uh, it's kind of a funny Hebrew word. They just, it, it can mean turn, like to turn in a different direction. It can also just mean to return, to come back. But here, you know, he's going to return and come toward the south. So the come is that, that word 935. So that's the common word that we have. And then toward the south, well, that's 5045. That'll be, so I'm just going to change how I put this here. Instead of putting the papacy, just, can put, just do it like that. So the papacy and the USA shall return and come towards the south. And, and I could just put, I guess, in, um, the north. 
shall return and come toward the south, but it shall be not not be um, so. It shall not be. So we're going to have the word not there. Yeah, three eight zero eight. Why do you why do you have that as the fall of Egypt in thirty A.D. when it should be B.C. Uh, why why do I make mistakes? No, I didn't say why do you make mistakes. I mean, you... because <laughs> that's obviously thirty B.C. But yeah. I'm used to typing 30 AD a lot. Where is that? Um, Toward the bottom of uh, verse 29. Oh, I see. Okay. Shall not be. And is the fall of Rome then in 331? No. For for um, 476. Okay. But but we we have to decide whether it's the fall of Rome. That's being talked about there as uh, the latter. Well, we're looking at this in in the vision of paganism, and so I'm just just looking to to understand it. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So what it's doing is it's bringing us to the time of the end in Daniel 11 verse 40 b, and it's saying that this is going to happen at the time appointed. We have a second time appointed. We have a time of the end in 1798. We have a time of the end in 1989. In a sense, both of those are the time appointed. That is, 1989 and 1798 are connected in one single verse. And they are a period of time in which the United States is uh, the days of one king. Right. The 70 years, the days of one king, the United States is that power. And so in that history, we have the U.S. Now, the U.S. is not the king of the north or the king of the south in 1798. But the United States rises in 1798. And so when we get to the time appointed, the, the Daniel 11, verse 40 B, it is the United States that's being addressed there. Right. So you just have first, you have France and the papacy in 1798. But those, I'll use the word evolved, into uh, the United States and the papacy together in 1989 against the USSR that is now the king of the south. So you have the United States and the papacy are the king of the north. And, and that this is logical based on what we've seen so far in Daniel chapter 11. That when we try to take these things and just place them all in that history and not recognize what's being said, that this is actually telling us that these verses are, these events are typical of something that's going to happen, that's going to be mentioned directly later in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. It's going to talk about this history more directly. But here it's just saying these things that have happened, these are now typical of something that's going to happen. And that thing that's going to happen in 1989, it's not going to be. So it's saying it's typical of it, but it's not going to be like it was in the former time or in the latter time. So it says it's going to be like it, but it's not going to be like it. Right. And does that make sense to say that something's going to be like something, but it's not going to be like something? Why would we say it's something is going to be like something? It's typical of something, but it's not going to be like it. How does that make sense? It's going to be like it, but not exactly like it. Yeah. And it's, so there's going to be a specific way in which it's not like it. Right. And, and that's and that's going to be explained why it's not like it. It's typifying it. We agree that this this is just um, it's going to be repeated. This history is in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. But there is going to be some something different. And so it's it's going to tell us what that difference is. And that difference is going to be expressed by what we see with the papacy. Right? Because this was paganism. This was the daily. Correct? Correct. Okay. And, and that's why I would argue for the fall of Rome. Because this is going to be the fall of Rome. And... And and we would actually have 476, we'll say, to 538. Does that make sense? So it's not just the fall of Rome, but it's the fall of Rome and the fall of, of paganism itself. Leading up to 
I mean, maybe I could put five away. I'll put five away. That might make more sense, actually, when we put in our uh, present truth application. Now, it's so it's going to talk about the fall of Rome next, right? So that's the other reason I would put the fall of Rome there. So the former was this fall of Egypt, and the latter is going to be the fall of Rome. And it's going to talk about the fall of Rome, and it's going to talk about the transition from paganism to papalism in the 6th century. So it's going to cover 508. It's also going to cover 538. Okay, and so so it's going to be the rise of the papacy, this um, this this uh, little horn power, whatever you want to call it, the abomination of desolation. That's going to make this history different because we now have a counterfeit of Christianity being this power. Right. We have the papacy. And even though Rome typifies the papacy. It's a counterfeit of the earthly sacrifices. The, right? Paganism is a counterfeit of the earthly sacrifices. Pagan Rome. Right? It's, it's paganism. But the papacy is a counterfeit of Christ's heavenly ministry. Right? It's a counterfeit of Christianity. It's, it's paganism addressed in Christian garb. And that is the particular thing of why it's, it's like this history but it's not. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's going to be Christians persecuting Christians in the period of the papacy. And so the papacy becomes again, a type of what's going to happen at the end of the world. Right. So we're going to have the rise of the papacy as we go through this and, and we're going to have some changes. This is Swearingen's uh, stuff. Now I just want you to point out here that, um, that Swearingen has some stuff similar to ours in verse 40 uh, and 45. But in, in verse 40, um, you know, he's going to have the the king of the north, papal room, in its healed wound state after 929, 1929. She'll come against him, the USSR, atheistic communism, like a whirlwind in 1989. The chariots and with horsemen, American military pressure with many ships. So So he's going to recognize this. And he's going to recognize, uh, destroy the Soviet Union by the end of 1991. So I'm pretty sure these are directly from Swearingen's. I don't know if I changed anything here. Um, but he has the same view that France is atheistic communism and, um, that there's, that they pushes that to him in 1798. And then the King of North comes in 1989, like a whirlwind. So it's very similar to our view. And I don't know if he studied our material or not. I don't know anything about him, but that's the view he has. He could have maybe just studied um, um, uh, Louis F. Weir. But anyway, so that's where we are. And we're going to have to draw out a present truth application. Um, but I'm not sure when we're going to start doing that. I, I, I sort of feel like I would like to go through the papacy first in the historical application before I start drawing out these lines, but I'm not sure what we're going to do. But anyway, is this, is this kind of making sense now? I mean, verse 29 could be pretty controversial. It's got a, it's got a good logical element so far. Yeah, and, and it's consistent with what we've been learning as we've been going through this. But it, but it is different in certain aspects than, than you know, Uriah Smith or Swearingen or pretty much anybody I've ever seen. Never seen anybody do these applications. So anyway, we'll approach this tomorrow and, um, you know, see where it goes, which, how we're going to, uh, you know, proceed. Cause I'm still not sure exactly. I mean, my, my mind is I would like to go through that, uh, the historical application just because I think this will help, help us understand, uh, the preceding verses when we start going through, you know, the fall of Rome. Uh, the baptism of Clovis, all of these different things as we put them in line in the rise of the papacy and just go all the way up to uh, verse 45. One of the things that this helps me with is Ella White makes the statement, you know, the history in this connection with this prophecy will be repeated. Now, she's saying it specifically in the history from 31 on, right? When she's talking about Daniel chapter 11, about the rise of the papacy. Um, we do we do apply it to all of Daniel 11, but she's specifically quoting those passages. 
But we can see in the preceding verses, it's telling us that this history is typical of something that's going to happen later, right? Something that's going to happen in 1798 and something that's going to happen in 1989. Now, Ellen White doesn't bring out those verses and, and say that, but in a sense, you could see that, that those verses are saying the same thing she was saying. Let's uh, close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for this new week. Uh, we ask for your continued presence in all that we do, that we may glorify you. And we pray for each each one. Help us in our personal walk with you, our daily devotions and studies, our prayer. Um, in the choices that we make, uh, help us, Lord, uh, to always keep you before us and and to ask for your help and strength. We are weak and we're in need of your presence. We pray for your angels' care and protection over our loved ones, our friends, and uh, also those that we minister to in various ways, whether it's in our work, um, in our contacts with people. But we ask that your Holy Spirit can speak to hearts and that you can use us uh, to your glory. Thank you for the things that we are learning. Help us to continue to to learn of you. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.